dispatch, how can I help you? Hello? Hi. Um, I'm not sure if this is quite the right number to call. Last night I got home from the bars with my girlfriend and she got upset at me and ran off. Mm -hmm. And I chased her and wasn't able to find her and I still haven't heard from her. Her phone's off. She has four, four younger brothers who desperately want their big sister home. I wish the court system in the state of Oregon would just hand him over to me and allow me to administer the death sentence. March 2nd, 1993 was the day that Kaylee Sawyer was welcomed into the world by her parents, Julie Van Cleve and Jamie Sawyer. They were a happy family for a time, but unfortunately, Julie and Jamie decided to get a divorce when Kaylee was still at a young age. Her parents decided to remarry, and Kaylee remained close to her new extended family with her step-parents, Crystal and Chris. When she was little, she couldn't quite pronounce her name and ended up calling herself KK Foyer. This nickname stuck with her family as Kaylee grew up caring for her four younger brothers, Zach, Cody, Jaden, and Caleb, who idolized and looked up to her. As her family's only daughter and eldest grandchild, she was constantly gushed over by everyone. With a positive outlook in life, Kaylee became a high school cheerleader and had many friends surrounding her, to the extent that her parents had to constantly remind her to slow down. However, Kaylee made sure to live her life to the fullest. By 2016, Kaylee was 23 and living the best years of her life. She worked as a dental assistant at the Aubrey Dental in Bend, Oregon during the daytime. She also attended school at the nearby Central Oregon Community College so she could become a dentist in the future. She lived at the college campus with her longtime boyfriend, Cameron Reimhofer. It seemed like her future was as bright as sunshine, but she didn't see the dark clouds approaching her way. On July 23, 2016, Kaylee attended her friend's bachelorette party. Initially, she planned to be out of town that day, but decided to participate in the party at the last minute. The blonde beauty met her friends at around 8 p.m. at a country western bar named Mavericks. When the party wrapped up at around 10.30 p.m., she wasn't ready to go home. So, with a friend in tow, Kaylee hopped onto another bar downtown, where she found herself inebriated and dancing with a stranger. Unfortunately, another friend saw this and immediately let her boyfriend, Cameron, know what was happening. The jealous boyfriend arrived at around past midnight and picked Kaylee up. On the drive home, Kaylee couldn't understand why Cameron was angry at her since the dancing didn't mean anything to her. Their argument turned into a heated exchange, and when they got home, Cameron thought they needed some time to cool off from each other, so he left her in the car. A few minutes later, Kaylee hadn't gone inside their home so he returned to his vehicle to check on her, but she wasn't there anymore. She often went for a walk whenever they fought, but it was different then. Thankfully, Kaylee answered his call and told him that she was walking down the street. However, Cameron got nervous again when she told him that her phone battery was about to die out, so the worried boyfriend started driving down the road to look for her. He also sent her several texts to preserve her battery. Then Kaylee turned off her phone, and nobody had seen or heard from her since. Throughout that evening, Cameron tirelessly drove up and down the campus streets, but to no avail. He even went to her friends' houses, thinking Kaylee had walked there. She didn't. At the time, Julie was also trying to get a hold of her, but her daughter wasn't responding. Morning came, and the worried boyfriend woke up to a still-missing Kaylee, so he tried contacting her father, Jamie, who was at church then. Cameron wished that he was just overreacting, and Kaylee was simply hiding from him to cool off. Jamie was also thinking along the same lines, but it wasn't enough to calm the boyfriend down. Cameron checked on Kaylee's car, which was still parked at a friend's house, where she left it before the party. He then went to Julie's house, and that was when they decided to call the authorities. Cameron told the operator everything that happened the night before, and that Kaylee had gone missing. In the parking lot, uh, it was like 1 o'clock in the morning. Yeah, she was mad at me, so I walked inside and told her to come meet me, and then when she was like, calm down. And I went back out in 10 minutes, and she was gone, and I called her a few times, and she said she was walking down the street. Julie also called for emergency services the same day, and gave the operator additional information regarding Kaylee's health to give more urgency to her daughter's disappearance. Yes, I need to have an officer call me. Um, my daughter is missing, but she has... Um, um, epilepsy and some medical issues. Word quickly spread of Kaylee's disappearance, and soon, 
Friends and family made sure to get her face out in public for people to see and recognize in case they had information about her whereabouts. Local news also reported about her disappearance, and people handed out flyers across the county. She has four, four younger brothers who desperately want their big sister home. Everyone tried to contact Kaylee's phone, but all messages went to voicemail. When she stopped responding to Julie's messages, the worried mother felt a shift in her body. She didn't want to believe it, but her maternal instincts were telling her that Kaylee was no longer alive. Cameron and Kaylee's friends were all taken in for questioning, but were almost immediately disregarded. The same was said about the man she was found dancing with at the bar. By 7.30 p.m. on Sunday, July 24th, 2016, Kaylee Sawyer was put into the database as a missing and endangered person after not being heard from or seen for more than 18 hours. By Monday, while everyone was looking for Kaylee, the most unpredictable thing happened at the Redmond Police Station. A rookie policewoman named Isabel Ponce Lara came into the police station, but she wasn't scheduled to be there at that time. She tearfully told the story of her husband, Edwin Lara, who worked as a campus security guard at the Central Oregon Community College and drove a security patrol vehicle during work. He moved to the United States from Honduras when he was just 11. He had a fascination with serial killers, specifically Angel Resendez Ramirez. His fascination led him to an associate's degree in criminal justice and his job in security. According to Isabel, she texted her husband at around 11.30 p.m. that Saturday night before going to bed. When she woke up at about 8 a.m., he was beside her. At first, she didn't notice anything strange. They just got up and started to get ready for church like they always do on Sundays. That was when she began to notice something uncharacteristic about him. As much as Isabel wanted to ask her husband questions about his behavior, she couldn't push him too much because they had marriage problems then. She feared that questioning him might have turned into an argument. By Sunday evening, he was more or less acting normal, so they watched a movie together, and Isabel thought it was the end of the issue. It was Monday morning when Edwin Lara found the courage to tell his wife the dreadful truth. He had ended a woman's life. In his story, the Honduran security guard had accidentally hit the woman with his vehicle, and in a moment of panic, he hid the body. Isabel kept asking him to explain more, but she saw that the man was starting to get anxious. Then the man dropped another bomb on Isabel and told her that he hid the woman's belongings in the shed in their garden. After that, Lara's anxiety reached a breaking point, and he told his wife that he had to go. Against his wife's protests, the panicked man took Isabel's handgun and drove off in his Nissan Altima. That was when the emotional wife decided to go to the police station and report everything that her husband told her. He just kept saying I panic and at that point he's already like he got up and he's already like going into the room and walking back and forth and I'm not really quite understanding. It didn't take the police long to realize that the woman Lara claimed to have killed was Kaylee. They sprang into action and alerted officers to be on the lookout for Lara's silver Ultima. Then they immediately searched the house and were shocked by what they had discovered in the shed. They found a white plastic bag with high-heeled shoes, a purse, black wallet, a passport, and a credit card. When the officers dug further, they found some more gruesome evidence that pointed out that it wasn't a simple accident, as Lara claimed. They saw a blood-stained rock, a clump of hair, and the suspect's work boots with blood on them. Unfortunately for the police, Lara immediately went to his parents' house in Redmond and swapped his silver Altima with their Subaru Legacy station wagon. When the police finally caught up with the Altima later that day, they discovered a large pool of dried blood in the trunk and even strands of hair at the rear bumper. With their evidence in hand, the missing person's case suddenly shifted into a homicide case with the killer on the loose, armed, and panicked. It was a dangerous cocktail that could escalate. Lara knew that he had little time left before the police sent out an alert for the station wagon he took, so he drove to Salem and parked the car in front of a Ross dress for less store. There, he searched the parking lot for a vehicle he could use. That was when he saw Andrea Elizabeth Mace sitting inside her gold Volvo sedan. She was tired from a 12-hour work shift and had just taken a selfie for social media. Andrea wanted nothing but to go home and rest after her long day at work. Unfortunately, a stranger with a gun opened the passenger door, got in, and ordered her to drive. She had no choice but to comply with the man. 
She could see the wild panic in his eyes and the slight tremble of the hand holding the gun. Any sudden movement, and she might lose her life. She thought her situation couldn't get any worse. But then the stranger started talking and introduced himself as the man who had murdered Kaylee Sawyer from the news reports. Laura even showed Andrea pictures of himself wearing the campus security uniform. The fugitive made her drive to California, where they checked into a motel. He made Andrea pretend to be his girlfriend at the check-in counter. Inside the room, he handcuffed her to the bathroom door while he took a shower. Afterward, he ordered her to take a shower, but she refused. Then Laura tried to have her drink sleeping medication. Andrea knew what he planned to do to her, so when her phone alarm went off, she lied to him and told him they were for her medication, claiming she was sick and could infect him. Her little lie worked, and Laura did not pursue her any further. Paranoia started to creep in along with Laura's panic, so he left the motel at around half past one in the morning. They drove until 5 a.m. to another motel, and he decided they needed to change vehicles there. He tried to steal an old man's car, but the man yelled for help. This prompted Laura to shoot him and flee with Andrea in tow. Fortunately, the victim survived, and Laura failed to take his car. The fugitive then ran to a nearby gas station and saw an old woman with two grandsons. Laura forced them to drive them down the road, and when they were far enough, he abandoned them and took off with Andrea on the passenger side. As they drove towards California, where Laura had relatives, he used Andrea's phone to record a video of himself to serve as his testimony on how he felt for everything he had done. Hi everybody, um, I just want to say that I apologize for everything I've done. Most likely I'm going to get caught. And, uh, sorry about that girl. About that girl in Oregon. After his lengthy video, he made Andrea post it on her social media account with the title, Murderer on the Loose. After that, he called his family and told them what happened. His talk with them seemed to have a positive effect on him because he decided to contact the authorities to surrender himself right after. Did I know that emergency reporting? He thought I'd been dead with Lara, and I'm the guy on Interstate, Interstate 5, going on high speed. I, I know you guys have the chopper up here already. Yeah. And I, yeah, I just want to say I am going to turn myself in. So, you know, I, I am wanted for murder in the state of Oregon. Okay. The California Highway Patrol caught Lara's speeding car and tried to pull them to the side of the road. The chase reached almost 100 miles per hour, and they were also followed by a helicopter monitoring the whole thing. When the sedan finally stopped and pulled to the side of the road, Lara's arrest was recorded by the officer's dashboard camera. Edwin Lara's crime spree had finally ended. He was arrested and brought in for questioning. Andrea, who was initially suspected to be an accomplice, was detained by the police but was freed when they figured out that she was just an innocent victim. During Lara's interrogation by Detective James McLaughlin, the main objective was to discover the truth of what had happened to Kaylee. Despite Laura's initial story of the accident, all the evidence against him suggested a violent end for the beautiful blonde college student. Finding Kaylee's body was also another main objective. Thankfully, Laura told them everything that happened on that tragic evening. An inebriated Kaylee was walking when Laura accidentally struck her with his vehicle. When the campus security guard got out of the car, all of the woman's pent-up anger from earlier that night came bubbling out of her, and she screamed at him. And at first I thought, you know, at first, you know, it's all angry, but I didn't hit her that hard. So I got out the car, and she was really drunk. And then she looks at me, and then she started screaming. She started screaming at me. She did. And then I was panicking. I didn't know what to do. She already seen me. She saw me face <clears throat> so I opened the door and that's when she came back she started screaming again so I grabbed her and I was telling her shut up shut up shut up, shut up. she was struggling to scream the security guard panicked he wanted her to stop screaming so he grabbed her to stop her breathing all of Kaylee's energy seeped out of her as she fell unconscious Laura then placed her in the back seat with her phone battery dead, there was no way for Kaylee to call for help after she regained consciousness. 
She was trapped in the back seat of one of campus security's vehicles. Child locks prevented her from opening the door, and the partition ensured she couldn't attack the driver. She quickly sobered up when the vehicle drove to a remote, dark campus parking lot. Still, she felt powerless as Lara committed unlawful acts against her. He then picked up a large rock with his strong hands. In the blink of an eye, he ended the life of Kaylee Sawyer. There was a moment in the interrogation room when Lara didn't want to tell the interrogators what had happened after he ended Kaylee's life. The Honduran security guard was a devout Catholic, and this was the thread that Detective James McLaughlin pulled to get him to confess everything, including the location of Kaylee's body. I've asked you for detail, and now I'm going to give you my arms. Okay? Those are the cold hard facts. Does God still love you? Will he forgive you? Will he bring you back into his heart? Questions you have to answer for yourself. There was even a grim moment when Lara went quiet and contemplated the life he had lived. He also confessed to the investigators that ever since he could remember, he had been having some fatalistic thoughts towards others, and that his wife had helped him control the urges tremendously. I think all throughout my life, I have struggled with somehow the urge but what has helped me not develop that in a sense was when I married my wife. After Laura's confession, the police investigators found Kaylee's body near a canyon off Highway 126, just as the Honduran man described. The body was deemed unrecognizable, and Kaylee's family was advised not to look at the horrendous photographs. Unfortunately, the judge rejected Edwin Lara's six-hour interrogation because his rights were violated when he asked for a lawyer. The silver lining came when authorities acquired the notes that Lara left in his car, which can also be accepted as a written confession of everything he had done that night. It even mentioned details like where he had ended her life. In January 2018, 18 months after Kaylee's death, Edwin Lara pleaded guilty to all charges and was sentenced to two life sentences without the possibility of parole. At the sentencing, Kaylee's family were given the chance to air their grievances and feelings towards the man who took the sunshine away from their lives. I wish the court system and the state of Oregon would just hand him over to me and allow me to administer the death sentence. In response, the Honduran man dramatically prayed for them, asking God to heal the broken hearts of the whole community. After that, the judge deemed what he had done cold-blooded and told Lara that he was very fortunate that a jury would not be sentencing him to death. The judge praised Andrea's courage and thanked Kaylee's family, offering them his condolences. Soon after her husband's arrest, Isabel Ponce Lara filed for divorce and resigned from the police force. She felt that she couldn't carry on with her role after the gruesome crimes her ex-husband committed. Kaylee's tragedy greatly impacted the state of Oregon with Kaylee's law. This law gives clearer rules for campus security officers to avoid them being mistaken for official law enforcement. It also requires nationwide background checks on campus officers to prevent students like Kaylee from falling victim to someone tasked to protect them. Jamie Sawyer was one of the strongest supporters, and years later the law was signed, giving her family a much needed win. I don't feel like we have closure. I think that we have a long road yet to go through. Um, I don't know if there'll ever be true closure on this. Um, he took someone that was extremely important to our family, and how can you have a closure on that? You can never say there's something that's purposeful enough for this, but at least if you get something, at least if you can see positive things that come from it, then there's actually, a, in a horrifying situation, there's some amazing things that are going on in their surrounding, the people we've met. I wish I'd gotten to meet her. Yeah, a lot of people do. Subscribe to watch more videos like this. Turn on notifications and leave a like to help the channel out. Thank you for watching.